Welcome to Future Histories, my name is Jan Groß and what you are about to hear is the second part of an in-depth interview that I did with Daniel E. Saros on digital socialism and the abolition of capital. We are about to dive in even deeper into Dan's proposal for a socialist mode of production with its own socialist laws of motion, all of which he describes in great detail in his book Information Technology and Socialist Construction, The End of Capital and the Transition to Socialism. If you did not listen to the first part of the interview, then I highly recommend that you do so, not only because it's super interesting, but also because today's episode kind of builds on the last one. I wanted to point the German-speaking audience to another episode of Future Histories that is concerned with the question of a socialist planned economy. And that is episode 19 with Jan Philipp Dabrich. And I wanted to guide all of your attention towards a book that I believe to be a fruitful, if not necessary, complementary read to Dan's book. And that is Refiguring Revolution, a Critical Theory of Social Transformation by Eva von Redeker, translated from German by Lucy Duggan. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Lucy. Sorry if not. You'll find the link to the introduction of Eva's book in the show notes. And I mention this book because Information Technology and Socialist Construction, so Dan's book, is concerned with answering a specific question. And that is actually still the question that had been asked in the historical socialist calculation debate. Can there be an intrinsically socialist mode of production that organizes its economy around autonomous socialist laws of motion without the need for markets? However, we do indeed need a revolution in order to get into the position of implementing such a proposal in the first place. And luckily, Eva von Redeker wrote a book about what this actually means, a revolution. If we turn away from this idea of a revolution as this one defining moment where the powers that be are overthrown and uh, everything changes all of a sudden, but instead look towards an idea of revolution as a praxis and as a process. And this is why I do believe this to be a great complimentary read to Dan's book. And I am very much looking forward to talking to her soon for future histories. I'll keep you updated. Before we finally get to the interview, thanks a lot to Kai for your support on Patreon and thanks to Bernhard for your donation. But now, please enjoy the second part of the interview with Daniel E. Saros on digital socialism and the abolition of capital. Okay, so maybe let me summarize a bit because I think this is, uh, of course, a lot to take in for the listeners as well, all at once. There are different layers and uh, uh, different approaches within the proposal. There is this general catalog, which could be seen as some kind of socialist Amazon, let's say. It's a huge catalog of use values, goods or services, where I can consume by placing my use value, the one that I want to purchase, within my needs profile, my personal needs profile. I would have to go to work in order to get credits. So that's just one of the, the, the things that is being expected of me. I would have to go to work. But within this work, I'm organized in a democratic way, in a workers' council that everybody who's working at this socialist enterprise is engaged in. So this will be organized very, very differently from, from how it is being done today. It would be some kind of democratic economy, actually on, on every layer possible. So then there are incentives in place within the system for me to uh, make a plan of what use values again goods or services i probably will consume next month for example and if i plan good and indeed purchase most of the things that i placed within my needs profile i am eligible for a bonus because i through uh, communicating my needs early on i helped The, with, uh, with the planning of the whole economy and made it easier for everybody. 
I will still be able to purchase items I did not plan for. I think that's very important to, to say. But it's just better for me and for everybody else, as I said, uh, for, the, for the functioning of the economy if I try to plan as good as possible and, and think ahead a bit. And so then the, the products are being produced based on me registering my needs within the general catalog. But there's a, a, a crucial question that comes up for me that I think I did not yet fully understand because how is the information of me ordering, let's say, 20 packages of milk being translated into points? It cannot be just the quantity of 20 of 20 packages of milk, so it's 20 points, because if I ordered 20 cars, then this, <laughs> this would, of course, be a whole different kind of thing. So there must be some kind of um, mechanism in place to translate my needs into points that has some kind of base in how many resources actually went into the production of this good. So how is this being managed? I, that was a huge question for me. Well, each use value would have a, a, a base unit, I guess. So if, a, say, if we're talking about one package, you said one package of milk, mm -hmm. that, for example, you, know, you would, could select that, place it in your needs profile. Depending on where you place it, that'll determine how many points are assigned to it. So if you place it higher, more points would be assigned to it. And if you place it lower, fewer points would be assigned to it. You could put in a whole block of use values, 20 packages, like you said, and you could arrange those consecutively in the profile or you could spread them out. If, you know, some of them, you, you don't feel like you need quite as much, you would rank them lower, others higher. So the workers council that posted that use value in the, in the universal catalog, general catalog, would be notified of the points that it can then use to acquire inputs to produce that use value. Um, Yeah, go ahead. As far as I understood it, at the end, the points will be communicated throughout the system mm. from the uh, registering of my need in the general catalog. Yes. The um, Workers' Council will get a certain amount of points that it will then use to buy inputs in order to produce the product. And um, this will go on and on and communicate throughout the system up until the resource of oil or wood and stuff like that. Yes. But if the weight that is communicated through me registering my need in the, in the needs profile is quantified only by how many items I purchased and where I positioned it in the needs profile, then it does not communicate how much resources went into the production of that given use value. Are you saying the consumers need inf that information? Well, the whole system needs this, this information in order to be termed rational. Because otherwise, so the, there would be the, the, there would be the chance of excess production where the the workers' councils, if they just react to the needs of the people, and the needs are um, translated into points, but not in a way that is any way related to how much resources are put in, then there's a discrepancy there. Well, you've asked a, an excellent question here. First, I, I think this situation is somewhat unlikely to arise because much of what we observe in terms of relative valuations in the marketplace and capitalist societies is likely to reproduce itself in a needs-based socialist society. So that is a, a package of milk will be ranked much lower and have fewer points assigned to it in most needs profiles. But let's suppose for the sake of argument that the use values do have a similar ranking for some reason. In that case, the workers' council that posted milk, for example, would receive more resources than it needs in the point allocation process. And it can virtually return the inputs during the point allocation period if it's receiving more than it needs to meet the current needs. Uh, once the current needs are addressed, however, this process can be repeated 
for the allocation of inputs for investment purposes. Investment could mean expansion in new facilities. Uh, and if milk is valued this highly, then such expansion for the purpose of increasing the amount of milk produced might be a logical use of this large amount of resources. The resources could also be used for product development and innovation, which might, might also be a good use for them. Even so, if, if the Workers' Council believes it's receiving too many resources beyond even what it can productively use for investment, it does have the option to virtually return the inputs during the point allocation process before it actually receives those inputs. But finally, let's suppose that all these adjustment factors that I've described fail and the Workers' Council, the Workers' Council that produces milk decides to use its large amount of points to acquire many more resources than it will use productively. And then at the same time, let's suppose that a workers' council that produces automobiles ends up with far fewer resources to meet the current needs. And so this, would, this could happen, to come back to your initial question, this could happen when automobiles and milk are ranked at the same level in the needs profiles. It might lead to far too many resources being devoted to milk production, not enough to automobiles. In this case, the, the workers' council that sells the automobiles, it will be producing too few automobiles because it doesn't have sufficient resources. And so it's going to raise their prices and credits because the, the general rule for pricing in the socialist society is to aim for the steady and complete sale of automobiles during the point allocation period. So because they don't have that many automobiles and there are a lot of consumers wanting to buy these, that's gonna cause the workers' council to raise those prices. So the, the rise in prices, of course, is going to frustrate the consumers. Some will not be able to make the purchase at all. And so those consumers will then raise automobiles in their needs profiles relative to milk and the workers' council that produces automobiles will gain points. So this process should continue until enough resources are devoted to automobile production that prices for automobiles begin to fall. And so in this way, I think the system will automatically work to correct this imbalance, but it may take time. But just like in a capitalist society, it takes time to shift resources from one industry to another in response to changes in consumer preferences. Oh, that's a very interesting answer. And I think it relates to a uh, kind of even bigger question. Since you do not have, as it is in a capitalist society, one unit of account, uh, such as money, uh, you come into a position where you kind of need to establish some kind of balance between credits on the one hand and points on the other. So the the underlying assumption, as you just explained it, is kind of that, that through these different mechanisms of pricing, ranking within the needs profiles, and the question of how many resources can be used in general in order to, to give away points uh, established through the Council of Scientists. These are the different elements that are um, thought of bringing about some kind of balance within the system. Do I get that right? Yes. I think you've actually hit on a very important point, and it's something I haven't mentioned previously in the interview, and that is that it is a moneyless economy that we're talking about. There is no money, not in the way that we know it. The points don't have, uh, I mean, this is a minor point, really. The points do not have any physical substance to them. They're, they're simply uh, electronic. But more than that, points aren't spent and received by someone else. It's simply a signal that's communicated from one workers' council to another, and that is then used to acquire inputs. So there's no money involved in the allocation of means of production to different workers' councils. Now, there are credits, at least in the socialist phase, although in the, in the higher phase of communism, or the communist phase, as I'm calling it, there, there aren't even credits, because at that stage, people 
use their points from their needs profiles, consumers do, in order to acquire use values. Because it, the, the distribution principle at that point is to each according to his or her need. So even the socialist credits go away. But in the, in the lower phase of communism, in the socialist phase, uh, the credits do seem to resemble money because use values have a price, credits are, are received by workers for their, for their work, and they receive credits for their for bonuses when they've registered their needs and then made those purchases. So those credits are used to acquire use values. Now that appears to be money, but the major difference there is that the credits, um, when they're received by the workers' councils that sell those use values, they don't use those credits for any purpose. Those credits actually, they vanish. They don't persist in any form. They're not spent again. That's how the system is set up. This is an important point because when credits are being distributed to workers and to consumers in the form of bonuses, that increase in the amount of credits in the system could be inflationary, could lead to hyperinflation, in fact. Once they're spent, however, because they cease to exist, that leads to an automatic reduction in the total amount of credits that are out there in circulation, or not in circulation, but in people's hands. And so there's a, uh, an automatic sort of way to, to control this total supply of credits. And it prevents hyperinflation or inflation from really developing. So the way I've described the, the use of points in the system, the use of credits, it's very different from money. And yet there's still a, a logic to the system that allows for the rational allocation of inputs. Uh, and I think the rational distribution of use values to consumers. Okay, just to make it super Uh, safe that I got that right. The elements that serve primarily to guarantee this economic rationality would be, on the one hand, the price, and on the other hand, how the consumers rank their needs within their needs profiles. Because um, I think my, my confusion from earlier about the points was addressing a question that I had on how the worker councils how the workers' councils would be incentivized to use their resources, their, their scarce resources of nature, in an efficient way, how that would be established, you know? And as far as I understand it now, I think you say that the, the answer to this would be that they would be incentivized to use their resources efficiently since there's some kind of uh, price pressure coming from the consumers as well. And if they just act recklessly with the, with the resources, with the points that they are being allocated, then this will feed back into the system. And um, by that, you, you have some feedback circles that are both communicating the necessary information on what is being scarce and a way to avoid non-efficient use of scarce resources. Do I get that right? Yes, I think that's right. I think the one thing I might add is that what I would regard as efficiency in this kind of a system isn't really the same as what we consider efficiency in a capitalist system. So even though there's a rationality to it in the way that resources are allocated, I don't think that the system is set up to pressure workers to work as long and as hard as possible. I think there are other, there, there's, there's space for other considerations that would allow workers to, to take into account the speed of work, the nature of their work, and not let efficiency in the capitalist sense be the only sort of value driving what they do. But it still involves rationality in terms of clear rules for the distribution of the the inputs, the means of production, and then also the final use values. I'm so glad that you say that because I'm actually split between a, a dual role here as an advocatus diavoli uh, on the one side where I try to imagine the, the arguments that 
critics will bring up and they will ask for economic rationality. And on the other side, of course, I totally advocate for different ideas of rationality when it comes to well, what this means within, in this case, a socialist uh, mode of production. And actually, I thought of two um, ways how to address these as well, because you could easily within the needs uh, within the general catalog you could easily put in uh, other factors that will be taken into into consideration by the consumers when deciding upon which product they will put into their needs profile you could put in the question of uh, what is now called externalities like the the extraction of ecological resources and the other one would be uh, for example happiness of the workers within the uh, workers council You could put in a anonymous uh, way of feedback on the happiness, happiness within the council. And then, of course, I would prefer to purchase a use value from a workers' council where people like to work. And this is a, a super important uh, thing to, to communicate in, 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 in such, a, uh, such a system, I guess. And it's totally lacking right now. Sure. I'm so glad you raised this point because this is one of the features of this kind of needs-based socialist system that it's supposed to, to elevate our, our consciousness, make us more socially aware. And the general catalog will include a lot of detailed information about each use value that we don't normally have access to. And a lot of it includes things like the conditions under which the, the use value was produced, as you said. And so consumers will be able to take that into account. So social movements like movements for animal rights and environmental protection, those kinds of movements will still play a very important role because it will encourage people to rank certain use values higher in their needs profiles based on what they're hearing and learning about the conditions under which these, these use values are produced. So, so glad you raised that point. One big question that came up is that you very much uh, depend on the categor category of the proletariat um, as a as a force, actually, <laughs> as a political force and um, as the the barrier of this uh, revolutionary ideas. And uh, of course, this brings up the question of whether this proletariat uh, actually still exists as a as a category, uh, especially in terms of of class uh, consciousness. Is this in the twenty first century still a thing? Well, I think that this proletariat, as we call it, it does consist of people that have very different living standards, uh, very different occupations, and so on. Uh, but the one aspect that all proletarians have in common, I think, is that they cannot live unless they sell their labor power. And that characteristic hasn't really changed. So they don't have sufficient wealth to guarantee that they can live from ownership of wealth alone. And so for a change in the mode of production, these people would need to recognize this shared characteristic and then take this kind of revolutionary action to change the mode of production. Uh, it won't be easy. You know, but I think it's a necessary condition. It, it would require a huge amount of cooperation and coordination across very, a very diverse group of people. Very diverse. But it's the necessary condition, I think. And also, on the other hand, I think, of course, it's, it, it sounds kind of old school, the, the category of proletariat, but the category as such didn't diminish. And I think because things are getting worse and worse and billionaires are getting trillionaires and the, the rest is uh, is getting worse, you know, uh, I think there's room for raising class consciousness <laughs> again and there's uh, an attractiveness to that as well, you know, I, I guess. I have one more on the category of freedom and individual I see and this is aiming at the actually at the inner structure of the workers' councils. At some point within the book, you mentioned that there will be a monitoring of the fulfillment of your work respon uh, responsibilities and that these will be communicated uh, via system administrators, uh, I think even at the end of the day, you, you, you write. 
Um, this seems a bit uh, much, I guess. Uh, but be, be besides the question whether or not it will be every day, there's first the question of uh, elitism as well on the on the on the hand of the system administrators, and then this kind of brings up uh, questions of, you know, ugly situations between the the peers um, in, in quotation marks that, that have to surveil each other in terms of how good did you work or how bad did you work and, and stuff like that. So this could get ugly, I, th I think. Sure. No, I, I had something a little different in mind. In terms of evaluation within the councils, the efforts ratings subcommittees would consist of uh, workers who are members of the council. That would be a rotating body. And, you know, Each council could decide on its own how much, how frequently it wants to rotate membership in that subcommittee. Those effort ratings would involve adjusting the annual income maybe once a year. When I said that the, or when I wrote that the workers council would communicate to the system administrators at the end of the day, what I had in mind there was just that work had been completed that day. Nothing more than that. And the reason I actually said per day was because whereas currently, you know, workers have to wait to receive a paycheck, maybe two weeks, possibly longer, in this system, there's no reason to delay. Workers can be paid immediately at the end of their workday. It's just a matter of making sure that since these system administrators actually are the ones that grant the credits, Uh, they would need to be notified that membership is still current, the worker still works as part of the council. That's all. It, it's not supposed to be um, a method of evaluation or something that would be withheld um, for poor performance. Yes, I, I didn't have that in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe there could be a rotating element as well to the system administrators so there is no power accumula accumulation in, in, in their hands, actually. Something I think like that's that. a good idea as well. There are some areas where I ask myself if your proposal might run into reproducing errors of the, of the current um, political, economical uh, system. The first one is about the role of competition, which I struggle with, I have to say, because uh, I, I find competition to be one of the... Uh, evils <laughs> within within our society um, many times I think not only but but most of the times I guess um, you state that a classless society can be expected to be quite competitive I think actually this is kind of uh, problematic um, because I'm, I'm not sure if this doesn't reproduce a, a conception of humans as a species that uh, that needs to be disciplined and and supervised you know i do get the point that the proposal should not be utopian i said it before and that um, other non-competitive proposals do have a omission here and often retreat to overly positive interpretations of how things will naturally uh, fall into place somehow but still i'm i'm not convinced of the large role of competition could you maybe explain why you decided to approach things that way Yeah, I, I want to emphasize that competition would play a really minimal role in the kind of socialist society that I'm describing. There wouldn't be competition between workers' councils, not directly, any, any kind of competition in terms of income determination. I mean, this would all be minimized, I think. Where there is competition, I think, and where I find it hard to eliminate competition is in in terms of workers trying to obtain membership in councils and to perform specific kinds of work. If one of the guiding principles is from each according to his or her ability, then I think that it's important that uh, workers and, and young people who are entering school and trying to to gain admission to an educational program let's say you know a, a young person wants to become a doctor they're going to have they're going to need to compete with their peers in order to secure those spots in those programs 
or to secure a spot in a workers council to do the kind of work that they want to do and because they have to prove that they're able to do it. That's really all I'm imagining for competition. And I, I find it hard to let go of that as a principle that would need to be in place to ensure that people do demonstrate ability. Yeah, I, I understand that, I have to say, <laughs> because it's a kind of a, a, a check as well, no? that uh, if somebody who really, really, really wants to become a doctor, but is just simply really, really not qualified to, to become one, then one has to be uh, somehow honest about it and, and find a way to, to, to evaluate whether the person is qualified or not. It's, uh, I guess it's a... It's a fact somehow. Uh, there's another element of competition, though, that I spot and wanted to ask you about, and that is if a workers' council decides to produce a product and they post it in the general catalog and other work accounts, workers' councils are also posting a similar product, then people might decide to purchase it from the, the, the one that builds it from aluminium and the other one that produces it with plastic that is, is not being purchased. So the needs will be fulfilled, but not mostly from the company or the, the socialist enterprise that uses the plastic <laughs> in my example. So there will be some kind of competition in with regards to, to that. And that might be spotted through when people purchase what, where, and they... Yeah. Then, then you might have an indicator on what is more popular or you have a rating system as well or a feedback system where people leave um, how they like the product or not. So there will be some indicators and it's good to have these indicators because they, they are helpful in order to organize the production as well. But this also introduces an element of competition, I guess, between the, the, the worker councils. How is this uh, conceptualized and... Um, used maybe yeah that's a great question you're right you're right it, it could be interpreted as a form of competition between the workers councils one council may find its uh, point allocations dwindling and another's point allocations are increasing this could create tension between those councils you're absolutely right i think one important point maybe is that the compensation for useful work isn't going to be affected. So there's less likely to, it's less likely to lead to resentment between those councils, at least for that reason. And if, if one council is finding its point allocation diminishing to the point where the council needs to dissolve and the other council is expanding, there's no reason why the expanding workers council couldn't say uh, or encourage the former members of the of the other council to join them, join the council since their enterprise is expanding. They don't need to come up with financial resources to pay those workers because that isn't how it works. All they need to do is invite them to, to join the council to become members and they'll be entitled to their, their credit income. As long as there's work for them to do, they can merge and, and resolve it that way in a, in a cooperative kind of way. Uh, so. I think you're right. I think, I think there are elements of, co of competition that don't disappear. But I think the underlying principle is cooperation in, in what I described, I think. Yeah, I would agree, actually, because, and I think the main reason for that is that the profit motive is eliminated. Because of that, you, you are incentivized to help the other much more than it would than if it would be a competition for profit and of course uh, and that may be utopian on my part <laughs> um it, it's if if you have a society that is organized around the the principles that you describe the hope is that one would internalize these different kinds of values as well 
And since there is no striving for profit, then then you won't wouldn't be incentivized to stab your peer in the back. But uh, you could easily and without a loss for yourself, like just coach the other uh, cooperative how to to produce it differently, that it might uh, uh, fulfill a better standard and stuff like that. And and I really like that in the in the way you described the proposal when you were um, writing about the. The internalized principles of capitalist of the capitalist mode of production, because it's it's not just about the 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 formal rules that we can have in uh, laws and stuff like that, but it's a capitalism also functions through the way that I internalize how the system is working and how I will have to behave in order to produce a likely outcome and this is kind of uh sucked up uh, uh with the um uh, baby milk what's the <laughs> the um it's it's like you you you're formed around these expectations as a person as well and it it's likely to expect that within the socialist mode of production there would be different types of values that are as well internalized that are more formed around the value of cooperation as you said it and so it becomes the question of how likely is a certain type of behavior being made. And I, I like that, actually. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And you know, one of the central, I think, insights of Marxian theory is that people's consciousness is actually transformed depending upon the you know, mode of production that, that governs society. And so we can't even imagine, I don't think, fully how much people's consciousness would be transformed if it moved to this kind of society. The value system, as you say, everything would be different. People would just think differently about everything. And hopefully in ways that are much healthier, much better. There's a, a second question relating to the question of reproducing errors that I have. At some point in the book, I had the quick flash where I was thinking, oh, Hoppala, this might be a reproduction of this there is no such thing as society phrase of, of Margaret Thatcher. And I'd like to quote you here in order to explain what I mean. The quote is, in his 1844 critique of different varieties of communism, however, Marx warns that what is to be avoided above all is the reestablishing of society as an abstraction vis-a-vis -vis the individual. The individual is the social being. And then there you end the quote of Marx. And then you continue to write, Therefore, it is only necessary to, to identify the manner in which the individual in a socialist society must interact with others to fully develop his or her specious consciousness. Because the market is deemed anti-ethical to this cause, it must be replaced with a new mechanism. And then, of course, you, you go on to describe the mechanism. But still, I, I was uh, asking myself if you're talking about a kind of individualistic approach that more or less mirrors this um, there is no such thing as society phrase from Margaret Thatcher, but just in a um, in a socialist manner somehow <laughs> maybe I'm I'm not phrasing this uh, correct but I hope you you, you get the point no, I think I, I do think I know what you mean I am at, what I'm imagining is that the public functions which I've described like the system administration the work of the Council of Scientists and so on would become sort of merged with all other processes in society in a way that doesn't seem like the state exists as something separate and standing apart from society. There still would be these public functions as I've described them, but I think the transformation in the way people relate to one another would allow those public functions to become sort of subsumed or or just part of, of society instead of standing apart or, or us imagining those state functions as being separate or apart from society. I don't know if that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. It kind of points to the question of withering away of the state or not, you know? That, yes, that, uh, that's right. And I don't think these public functions would wither away and disappear. I mean, those are still going to be there. Yeah, but it wouldn't be a state that is uh, uh, apart from us somehow. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. 
I was wondering if we might run into problems of uh, promoting quantification if uh, if we handle certain aspects of your model uh, the way that you describe it. Because if, for example, care work and um, stuff like that, education and, and um, things like that would be a part of the general catalog and would be handled throughout the mechanisms that you described, then they would be handled in a way as if they were quantifiable, even though uh, these areas are having a internal logic that is not adequately represented in terms of uh, quantification. And that's a problem that we do see right now, where neoliberals uh, try to Uh, reform the the healthcare system um, along the lines of quantification, and they, to be frank, fucked it up, and <laughs> and uh, we do not want to replicate this idea of an overarching um, principle of of quantification um, within these these systems. So how how would you handle that? Yeah, it's a great question, and and maybe um, this society would encounter problems in trying to extend this principle to these areas. Um, I'm willing to allow for, for that possibility. However, with care work, for example, the one possibility would be, you know, that uh, if a family decided to perform that work uh, themselves, you know, maybe designate one person in the family to do that work, then it would be possible for that person to receive compensation for that work. And they would just, they would just do what they, what they would do in the home. There may be workers' councils that specialize in care work. And in that case, to include that in a needs profile, it would just be necessary to, for the workers' council to post in the general catalog a unit of that service, like maybe an hour of work. That could then be moved into the needs profile. The workers' council specializing in care work would receive the point allocation according to that and then could obtain the inputs that it needs in order to, to perform that service for those people who registered a need for it. So I think things like care work can be handled. Again, maybe it would encounter problems I'm not, I'm not seeing, but uh, at least I think we can imagine a way to do it. With education, that's also, that's a difficult one. And, and like you said, I've, I haven't filled in all the details in the book. Others are gonna have things to say about this, hopefully. And they may have ideas on how to make this work. But I at least I at least have some ideas regarding education. I think that it, it's easiest, I guess, probably to start with an example where where you have a, let's say, an educational program that trains workers to do a specific type of work. Well, if that's the case, they're going to be producing some kind of a use value in the future, and so whatever the current registered needs are for that use value could be used to determine the point allocation for that educational program or that educational institution, those points then could be used to acquire inputs, whatever is needed in order to educate students in that program. So maybe I am overreaching. Maybe I'm saying, hey, this can apply to everywhere. But I think we can at least think about how it might work. Now, if for some reason we ended up rejecting as a society, if, if we ended up rejecting it because it somehow is just not doesn't work well you know we should be open to that i think but i think we also should make the effort uh if we really do want these to be the guiding principles of our society you know from each according to one's ability to each according to one's work initially and then to need later then it makes sense to try to do it And also, I think there will be some kind of mechanism for infrastructural work for like roads or trains and stuff like that. And you could easily say that, okay, education uh, as well is a, a basic infrastructure that we all need. And uh, of course, it is also important to have some moonshot projects. It won't work that you will always know what kind of education you need because it's good to have some education that does not have a specific use just because you might just know not know what use it will have in the future so it's it's an investment in, in investment that uh, still makes sense because you might 
uh, foster insight into areas where you do not yet know that they will be of use in the future. So, so that's uh, that's like infrastructure, uh, knowledge infrastructure somehow as well. No. Yeah, um, yeah. You 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 uh, you picked up on the fact that I chose the easier uh, example, <laughs> and I chose an educational program that's <laughs> aimed at producing a use value. Uh, <laughs> Yes, and so that's more complicated, and and so like the more basic education is, you know, we'd have to think through yeah. how could we maybe make that work, and it may be that in those situations we pull the points from from many different areas uh, in order to allocate points to those educational institutions. I mean, we may be able to do it that way, since uh, you know those institutions may be teaching you know just basic science. Maybe we can pull points from lots of workers' councils where that's where knowledge of science is relevant. There might be ways to do it. That's just something that our elected representatives are going to have to work out and determine how to make that work best. I'm not sure there's any other way that we can just say right now exactly how to do it. Yeah. But there are ways at least. Yes. I think in order to to get a sense of how this proposal could be beneficial for all of us, let's engage in a, in a thought experiment. If there had been a socialist mode of production and socialist laws of motion in place in the way that you described them in your pr proposal in the US during the corona pandemic, how would that have been beneficial in your opinion? Well, I, I certainly don't want to suggest that all human problems will disappear with the transition to this new mode of production. But I can think of a couple of benefits. First, I think that people will rank basic needs very highly using their needs profiles, including the need for medical care. Um, so many of society's resources will be devoted to health care. And so the strain on this sector should be reduced in a situation like this. Also, I think pe people are going to be accustomed to thinking about others and less about just kind of doing business as usual. So, you know, people have made a great effort to engage in self-distancing, but I think that you would see even more self-sacrifice in this kind of a society. In addition, we wouldn't have powerful interests spreading false information to ensure that the economy continues to grow rapidly. People's health really would be sort of the top priority, I think, in a situation like this. And that would be helpful. And finally, the profit motive would not promote you know, the shameful mistreatment and widespread abuse of animals, I think, that exists in capitalist societies. So these kinds of pandemics, I think, would be less likely to probably occur. The likelihood of diseases originating from you know, oppression of animals, I think, would, would, would decline significantly um, if we transitioned to this other kind of way of living. And I think also because of the uh, historical examples of plant economies, people will immediately say, ah, oh, we know that plant economy, that's a super slow apparatus and they won't be able to react that fast in the case of a pandemic. And then you need uh, ventilators, but the state apparatus is so super slow, so they won't be able to do anything. Uh, I mean, you're... Uh, proposing a very, very different kind of um, a system that is actually much more decentralized and has very different uh, base assumptions. But how, how would that relate to this fear of uh, not being able to react fast? This isn't something I, I gave that much attention to when I was writing the book. One point that does come to mind that I did address, which is somewhat similar, I think, is... Um, has to do with natural disasters. So if there was a natural disaster that caused a large part of the population, let's say, to lose internet access, it might be possible to set up the system so that immediately those needs profiles of those people transitioned to kind of a, a more general one that would focus on their on addressing their, their most immediate needs first. And then society's resources, point allocations would be redirected towards meeting those needs uh, immediately. So there might be ways to build in kind of emergency responses into the system. Again, I think the system is very flexible. There are ways to sort of to work on those problems in ways that I don't even think I've fully you know, thought about. 
And also, I think, again, the, the, the question of the profit motive is uh, very crucial here, because in the, in the case of a pandemic or any disaster, actually, if you do not have the profit motive uh, that hinders the collective forces of, uh, of all humans to, to work towards a solution, then you will be better off, I think. I mean, we saw that people were hoarding masks and stuff like that and holding them back because they thought they would get some profit out of it later on. And people needed these masks, of course. And so so this is just destructive behavior, I think. And, and yeah. this would, uh, there, would be, there wouldn't be an incentive to, to behave in, in ways like that, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think it's also important to at least uh, tease the idea of how we could get to implementing the proposals that you are describing in your book. So there, there has to be some kind of idea uh, towards a transition phase and uh, um, subsequent implementation of, of what you're trying to do here. Maybe let's just take a small country like Austria, where I live right now, uh, as an example. What would you propose uh, in terms of a transition? What would this uh, look like? How, how to proceed? Well, the sort of revolutionary transformation that I'm talking about really won't work unless it's broad enough to include major industries. So if it's small, then workers' councils will be, they'll be forced to rely on markets to obtain inputs. And they're going to need to obtain currency. And that means selling products as commodities. So this transformation is going to have to be very broad, very expansive for it to take hold. I do think that one nation could transform the mode of production, but it will have to rely on international trade to some extent. So I provide some suggestions in chapter eight of the book regarding how, how this might work. So like in, in some cases, consumers might register a need for a foreign commodity that is not available domestically. The workers' council that posts that foreign commodity would receive points to produce something it would use the points that it receives to produce something that it can trade as a commodity for the foreign produced commodity. So there might be ways to still obtain goods from capitalist nations while transforming your mode of production domestically. But still, I think too much reliance on commodity exchange is going to undermine the momentum of this shift to a new mode of production. So that those are at least some, some thoughts about how one might do it with one might pursue such a transformation in a small country, but obviously the smaller the, the experiment is, the more obstacles it's going to face. And apart from small countries, what are the, the couple of steps that you would propose uh, if one wants to get on the pathway to a transition in general? Yes. Uh, so it would be necessary first for individuals to start communicating their needs using needs profiles and workers would need to start actually posting use values in a general catalog. So all of this can start before any kind of revolutionary transformation takes place. The infrastructure is, is there. It would just be necessary to actually start setting it up. This would also be a good time to, to be educating people about how this system is going to work. People are going to have to understand if they're going to actually move forward in trying to implement this. Only after all of that is really kind of in place would it then be possible to use it to start guiding resource allocation, to have workers actually take control of the means of production and so on. And I mean, you know, it, it, would, it would require also, you know, a political movement workers and consumers would would need to support political party and candidates for office who would actually want to try to pursue this these kinds of changes so i think you know those are the things i see happening before there's even any abolition of private property or private ownership of the means of production these things would would need to take place first the educational effort and the effort to actually start setting up a general catalog and needs profiles and so on That's super interesting. So if I understand that correctly, this would mean that you would necessarily have a hybrid version before and that we could actually start now to build this hybrid 
like the like a shadow economy actually with a needs uh, with a, a general catalog where only um, use values are posted that are being produced um, with certain standards like only use values from cooperatives for example so and if it grows and grows and grows and grows then you would be more and more able to rely for most of your daily purchases on the use values of the general catalog and that it would like um, that you would be able to fade out your purchasing via money and uh, substitute it through purchases that you do on the general catalog am i right yes that's right i the one thing I, I might add is that what is posted in the general catalog during this phase might also include commodities produced by you know, capitalist firms. So not just uh, like workers cooperatives, there would need to be protections in place for workers to actually do this because capitalist enterprises may not want their commodities uh, listed there because they know where this is moving and they, <laughs> there's going to be resistance. So that's why protection from the state for these efforts would also need to be in place. And that's why the political movement is important too. Can't just do this and not expect capitalist interests to kind of look the other way. They're, gonna, they're not going to like this. They're going to resist. And um, so, yeah, so that's the thing I would add. So, I mean, we I actually pressed you on <laughs> quite some topics already, but still I'd like just to generally ask you, because we talked about the shortcomings of, of um, market socialism and we will talk about uh, Paracon, another proposal soon. I'd just like to ask you as well, what do you think are the shortcomings of your proposal? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked me this question because it forced me to critique my own proposal in, in more than I have, I think, previously. But some use values, I think, are easily incorporated in needs profiles and others are not so easily incorporated. For example, shoes, you know, are easily included, whereas something like housing is more difficult. I mainly hope to promote discussion of this proposal because I think there are many intelligent thinkers who are going to be able to think through some of these difficult questions. Um, I view what I did as mostly initiating this conversation, not as providing any kind of final answers on all of these questions. And you, you pointed out, and I think rightly so, that there are certain use values and certain kinds of services uh, like care work and education. These are going to be difficult to include. So that is a shortcoming, I think, but maybe one that we can overcome by trying to work out the details. The other shortcoming I think is that it might lead to complications that I just have not anticipated and that perhaps no one can anticipate. I mean, what we're talking about is such a, a radical and drastic change in the way we live that we, there's no, no way to know completely how it would play out. So, you know, these complications that come up, they could make the system unworkable for some reason. I'm willing to acknowledge uh, that possibility. However, I also think that we're approaching the time where we, we must have an open discussion about alternative economic systems if we're going to address these global environmental challenges that are really threatening all of us at this point. Now, of course, you are not the first one to propose an alternative political economy since the socialist calculation debate took place. There have been others before, and you discuss an approach called participatory economy or short Paracon at length in your book. How does Paracon differ from your proposal? And since it is already being practiced, where and how is it being implemented today? Uh, Paracon was developed by Michael Albert and Robin Hanel in the early 1990s and has been developed quite a bit since that time. Paracon is a non-market participatory economic planning model that aims to promote remuneration based on effort and sacrifice in production. So that's one of the similarities, I think, to my perspective. It also involves council democracy, and so it includes workers' councils and consumers' councils that contribute to the formation of annual economic plans. 
uh, their planning process involves something called an iteration facilitation board. It announces so-called indicative prices with the council submitting plans. Um, and then the prices are set to account for social costs, not just private costs, the way market prices do. The prices are also iter iteratively adjusted to clear markets, surpluses and shortages. Workers in a Paracon society also work a variety of jobs uh, as part of a so-called balanced job complex. So that is that you know, workers are assigned a mix of jobs with some of the jobs being more empowering than others. This is a significant difference from my proposal. I don't have an element of this really where, where job complexes are formed and involve a, a balancing of empowering and disempowering tasks. But the idea is that this, this approach is supposed to ensure that a class of workers never arises that only performs disempowering work and avoids the rise of a class of workers that specializes only in coordination and what Albert and Helen Hanel call a coordinator class, which they think could easily arise in and has arisen in socialist societies of the past. They also think a set of values underlies, should underlie the Paracon economy. So these values include things like solidarity, equity, self-management, diversity. There have been Paraconish experiments that have been initiated in different countries, including Finland, Sweden, the UK, and the United States as well. Robin Hanel has a forthcoming book actually on democratic economic planning. So in terms of you know, what I think the shortcomings are, these ideas had a major impact on me. So I really want to emphasize that. Much of the socialist proposal that I developed in the book built on their vision of a participatory economy. And so I have great respect for, for them as visionaries. I have several objections to the Paracon vision, however, that I think distinguish my proposal from their proposal. So first, I think that the participatory planning process involves uh, a trial and error method of adjusting prices that resembles the early suggestions in the socialist calculation debate. And I really wanted to kind of move away from that. I think we need a more dynamic and organic method of organizing the economy. I also think that the balanced job complexes do not do enough to protect freedom to pursue the occupations that one enjoys the most. So I, I also deviate from them there. I think from the, the phrase from each according to one's ability is more likely to be achieved if we allow workers to compete for jobs on the basis of ability, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, I also think the emphasis on a moral basis of the system is problematic. And you know, that too is something that makes my perspective, I think, different from a lot of thinkers on the left, this sort of uh, skepticism about objective morality. I don't think we should try to pursue values or ideals that are detached from sort of objective conditions. Um, that's sort of how I think about it. And instead, you know, we should be focused on ending capitalist exploitation, which I think is something we can discover through an analysis of existing conditions. And so we should be focused on that rather than sort of striving for these, these value ideals. But even so, even with all that said, I think Paracon offers features that I find to be attractive. And, and they, again, they really influenced me in the development of my proposal. Great. And uh, what I was actually a bit surprised to see is that you didn't really cover the proposal by Cockshed and Cottrell at length. Maybe I was surprised because I did an interview actually with a PhD student of Cockshed um, before in German, actually. So I, I was a bit familiar with the ideas there. And, and because it's one of the more prominent proposals out there for some kind of let's say, digital socialism. I, uh, I was expecting to, to read more about it, but you didn't cover it that much. Um, I do see differences, of course, mainly in the, in the decent, decentralized, uh, centralized access. So how do you relate to the proposal of Cockshed and Cottrell and how is yours unique in relation to theirs? Well, yeah, I would say that the, The really uh, embarrassing truth here is that limitations on my time were the reason that I did not investigate it in detail. Uh, I had to make some choices, and Paracon was the, the one that I decided to really devote attention to. I think that what makes mine unique is that it grew out of my work on Marxian theory. And this, is, this point is really quite subtle. You can see it if you compare my work on Marx's theory of the turnover process of capital 
with my breakdown of the socialist circulation process into five phases. I use a timeline to do that in the book. And it, it, it really did. It emerged from my close analysis of reading Capital, volumes one and two in particular. And, uh, you know, so for this reason, I think that I like to think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think that I've developed the only vision of the socialist mode of production that is really consistent with Marx's theory of the capitalist mode of production, which is quite a, a strong claim to make. But I, since it emerged from my study of, of Marx's capital, I think, I think I can make that claim. I, I don't think the other alternatives achieve that, finding you know, a, a substitute for that movement of capital that I described earlier, um, and that's found in volume one of Marx's Capital. So yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have much more to say in terms of my relationship to uh, Cockshot and Cottrell's um, proposal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I think comparisons would, would definitely be worth investigating in more detail. Yeah. To me, it seems as if you were more striving for a kind of organic socialist law of motion and that Cockshot and Cottrell seem to be looking for, and I'm being polemic here, uh, seem to be looking for a perfect plan that can be computed You know, and that's very different from from the way you approach things uh, in in a very basic uh, level, on a very very basic level, I think. So, the book came out in 2015, and now it's five years later. So, I think there might be some development on different ends, uh, not the least technological. So, Amazon got a hold of more and more and more and more of our lives and economies. And uh, by doing that also kind of engages in a proof of concept <laughs> when it comes to the question of general catalogs. So uh, they are, for example, doing things like um, giving you a better price if you subscribe to certain products. So that kind of re- reminded me of of the idea that you should uh, plan ahead and uh, put in your needs in the in the general uh, catalog and stuff like that. So some of these things are already being done, but in a, of course, capitalist uh, fashion and uh, um, within a capitalist mode of production. What, what has changed in these last five years? What did uh, disprove or prove your proposals to be right? Yeah, you've asked an interesting question here. In his review of my book, actually, which um, appeared in the Review of Radical Political Economics, John Willoughby uh, has dubbed my proposal Amazon Socialism. I don't know if you encountered that. Yes, I read it. I read it, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I found that to be amusing that he called it that. And uh, I think you're right. I think there are elements there that are similar to what I've described. So it has a massive offering of commodities. That I think suggest or shows that we have the technical infrastructure to, to make it a reality. We can have a general catalog that has a massive amount of use values and, and the specifications are, are clearly listed in great detail, but it's still commodity production ultimately. And, that, and it represents capital and motion. And in that sense, what Amazon does is nothing like what I've proposed. So there's definitely an element there that's similar, but also it diverges significantly. And, uh, and there are some things too that, are, that would be, I think, emphasized in the general catalog that, that aren't emphasized you know, in, in Amazon's listings, for example. You know, for example, like the, the date range for the purchase in order to qualify for a bonus, things like that. Those are, I guess, elements that, that don't really apply in the realm of commodity production um, that do apply in the, in the socialist proposal. So. Or the question of environmental destruction. <laughs> It's not listed on Amazon yeah. as well. It's just called externality. <laughs> Um, but did you read the um, piece by Evgeny Morozov in the New Left Review called oh, yes. Digital Socialism? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, because he, he talks about your proposal at length as well, no? Yes, I was really grateful for that review, um, or for that, at least that analysis of what I, what I wrote, and I think it helped gain attention for the proposal, yeah. And he's pointing out the need to socialize the means of feedback production, I think is the phrase, because uh, when you talked about Amazon and how it is different and how it still might be helpful, I think that's a that's a point to emphasize. It's There is a technological infrastructure um, of means of feedback production that is actually the basis for why you say that This proposal is possible now and it hasn't been before. You know, I think that's the circle how we get to the to the beginning of the interview that you state that Marx wouldn't have been able to see this solution. And by that, it was kind of clever not to engage in what would have been a utopian speculation at the time. If you uh, would have wanted to sketch the these ideas of how socialist mode of production could look like um, and and so he refrained from it that's kind of one of one part of the argument no yeah yeah and I, I think if we if we don't accept what I've said here then what is it that Marx did and was it just a, a I, 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 I don't know like some people believe it was just a big lie <laughs> But why, why, why is it the lie then? Because I mean, if you if you provide a super good analysis of the capitalist mode of production, it's still some, it's good work, you know. <laughs> yes, it's, it's and, something. Yes, and so so that may you know it it could leave us though with a very depressing sort of conclusion that what Marx did was this extraordinary analysis of capitalism. And we're all condemned forever now to live in a in a society based on class exploitation. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know that is so <laughs> that is so depressing. So I think a lot of people don't want to think that way about it. So instead, they say, "Well, he was wrong. He just got it wrong. You know, his kind of his system's contradictory or whatever. You know, the transformation problem proves he was wrong or whatever." Yeah. Um, I mean the the deterministic idea of uh, how the the uh, like uh, how the phases will one lead to another and then there will be this revolution and da 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 that was wrong but that doesn't mean that the analysis of the capitalist mode of production was wrong I I mean yeah. it's not yeah. that, that easy but I think this is um, One of the main benefits uh, that I got from reading your book is that I do not believe that we have to suffer this uh, exploitat exploitation uh, for the rest of our lives and into eternity, but there are different uh, modes of production that can be achieved. And <laughs> this is actually that this, this leaves me optimistic and not depressed, I have to say. <laughs> Well, that's great. I'm so glad because I wanted to. I wanted to complete the story somehow. This is this is what could emerge from capitalism, and and it's a, a future that uh, that that can give us hope. Yes, but it's not a it's not a, it's not a completion though. It's a it's an opening, I'd say. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then. At the end of each of my interviews, I always ask the question, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? Well, I think, you know, this idea that, that one day uh, everybody might cooperate uh, within this kind of global system of production and distribution is such an exciting possibility in the society that I've tried to describe today. You know, everyone's needs are given equal weight in the economic process and no one takes advantage of others for material gain. It's hard to imagine, you know, with all the problems facing our, our world today that we could live in a society like that. Um, but I think actually it's become easier to imagine than ever before. And we just, we need to have this conversation and, I'm, you know, I'm so grateful that you initiated this and that you're willing to share these ideas um, with the people of Austria and, and, and with people everywhere. So I'm 
you know, deeply grateful to you for doing that. Thank you. Well, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of Future Histories.